welcome in the name of Jesus. You are welcome again to the daily broadcast from Beverton Christian Network. My name is Stephen Leaza. On the State of the Union, the Union of Jesus and His Bride, the Church. Now, if you are joining us for the first time, we have had two solid months of daily broadcasts. Daily. This time, every day since Christmas Day of 2021. And today is February the 24th. We are still about the business of tell my people to return to me. God says, tell my people to return to me. And in all that time from Christmas to now, which is exactly two months to the day, we have looked at different possibilities different scenarios, if you like, different infractions, which have brought on the business of God needing to say, tell my people to return to me. Today, because this happened today, happened to me today. I want us to take perhaps a more proactive stance in this business of return to me, say the Lord. I will be reading a couple of scriptures to drive home, I said a couple before it would have been maybe one or two to drive home certain things. But I said taking a, 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 a proactive measure, getting involved in this thing, we have to respond to God in returning to Him or to return to Him. He says, tell my people to return to me. The returning has to be done by the people. Not God. He may help, like we are doing now, but the actual turning, the actual returning, repenting, restoring or restoration has to be from our side. Now let me give an idea what we are about today. You know, in Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says from verse 1 that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But then it goes on to say that the earth was covered with darkness. Still with darkness. Well, not just darkness. It says that the earth was without form and void. And darkness covered now God looked at this scenario on the earth and it wasn't something that he wanted so what did God do he spoke he spoke into existence what he wanted to see he said let there be light and it was so why didn't God say, let the earth bring forth fruit-bearing trees? Why didn't he say that first? Why was it that he said, let there be light? Why was that the first thing that is written that he said? You know, over in the, over in the, in the time of Jesus, there's a statement credited to Jesus, I think in John chapter 12, or something. he says, walk now when you still have light. For a time is coming when you will not have light and you won't be able to walk. 
In other words, you cannot do anything during darkness or in darkness. Not much can be done in the dark or during the dark. Of course God knows that. So the Bible says that darkness covered the face of the deep. The whole earth was covered in darkness. Formless, void, no shape, no, no just an empty blob. An, an empty blob of black. And God knowing what he wanted, he started by dealing with the darkness. He said, let light be. And that was the end of the darkness. Now I take that, let's call it a principle. I take that principle and I bring it to the situation we are dealing with, tell my people to return to me. So God's people, according to God, have turned from him, have walked away from him. How? Today, let's examine, if I say totally new, I don't mean that it just came into existence yesterday. It's been it's in the Bible, it's been there all, all along. A totally new dimension for this series of broadcasts. I haven't, we haven't dealt with something like this up to now. So I said I would share several portions of scripture to help us along the way. So starting starting from Ephesians chapter 4. Starting from Ephesians chapter 4 right at verse 1. Let's begin to read. Our James chapter 4, verse 1, rather. He says, James chapter 4, verse 1, he says, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? He says, You lost and have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and you war, yet you have not, because you ask not. He says in verse 1 that even these lusts, they war in your members. Now, if you go over, over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we will see, and, and several other scriptures really, we will see that the reference to your members has a twofold, uh, in two dimensions. On the one hand, it refers to the individual Christian, one person who has many members in himself. I'm not talking about members of a church now. Many members, many aspects of you. For in, in First Corinthians chapter 12, it says that even you, though you have many members, you are still one body. In the same way, the body of Christ has many members, but we are one body. For just as Christ is one, so is his body one, although it has many members. So in the individual Christian, we have many members. In the church, the body of Christ, there are many members, which will now be the individual Christians. So he says that these things, fights, fightings, and war, that they come from our lost which war in our members. So in the individual Christian, there are some things going on in you, in you. Let's call it because of the body of sin, which is supposedly, as which supposedly has been dealt with. And then in the body, in the larger body of Christ, with its many and varied and diverse members, these things continue. It's the same language. Your members. Your members as part of the body of Christ having many members, and your members as part of the individual Christian having many members. So let's go over to Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, 
seek those things which are above where Christ seated on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Then he says in verse 5, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, body of Christ members, and your own members as an individual in the body of Christ. He says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. You are to do that. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. That's what the church to do. Why? He goes on. He says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. And then he says, For we think sake the wrath of God cometh upon the children of disobedience. In the which you also walked sometime when ye lived in them. But now ye have you ye also put off it's about now ye also put off all these things. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not to one another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. Seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Why is the apostle writing this to the church? Why is he talking about these things in reference to the church? Because they are dead. Not just that they are dead. These are the things making it difficult for the larger body and the individual person to be conformed to the image of Christ, one, or for Christ to be fully manifest in them, the body or the individual person. These are the things. So he says, mortify therefore your members. What's the meaning of mortify? Morti mortify, mortician, mortuary, monk. Put to death. Who is going to do that? The Holy Spirit? No. You. Deal with it, he's saying. Okay, over, over at, at Proverbs chapter 23, I think, he says, if, if, you are, if, you are, if, you are set, if you are sitting at table with the king, or if you like a big man, and a sumptuous meal is set before you, and you know that you have a large appetite. Locally, we call that long throat. You know that you have a large appetite. He says, put a knife to your throat. It's not saying that you commit suicide. He's saying, deal with your large appetite. Control yourself. That's for you to do. He said, mortify your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things say the wrath of God is coming upon the children of disobedience. Now you make sure that these things are not among you. Then he goes on to say, now put off all this anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communications out of your mouth. Yes, we have become a new person in Christ. That's true. Why is he mentioning these things then? Why is it written? And we know that this letter is written to the church. Why is somebody talking to the church about these things if not that they were happening among the individual members and among the members of the larger body? It says there is something you have to do. There's something you have to do. You have to deal with these things that have turned you from God, that have made it impossible or difficult for God to be expressed through you or in you. Deal with those things. Set them aside. But it continues. Ephesians chapter 5, we we'll start reading at verse 1. It says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also had loved us, and had given himself for, for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling sorrow. Then verse 3, it says, But fornication and uncleanness and covetous, let it not be once named among you as become it sins. Let it not be once named among you. Fornication, uncleanness, covetousness. Let it not be once named among you. Who is the you there? You, the Christian. 
the church. These things ought not to be. We shouldn't be hearing about them in the church. He said, let it not be once named among you. That is, you have to do something about it. He said, verse 4, he said, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no homonger, no unclean person, no covetous man, who is an idolater, had any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things, come the wrath of God upon you. He's saying it again. He said, be ye dead, he said, be not ye therefore partakers with them. The Holy Spirit is not going to do that for you. He said, be not ye therefore partakers with them. Don't join them in these things. Who is the them? Children of disobedience. Don't behave like them. Why is somebody saying this to the church? Because the writer, the author, which in this case would be Apostle Paul, knew that these things were happening in the church. And then in Ephesians 5, verse 8, he says, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are you light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Why will anybody be telling you to walk as children of light if it was not possible for you to be walking in darkness? I go on, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, from verse 1. He says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk, and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to paint, neither yet now are you able. For you are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal, and walk as men? My God, are you not carnal and walk as men? He's talking to the church. Are you not carnal and walk as men? He's talking to the church. He's talking to the church. Now, in reading all these portions of scripture, remember I said at the beginning, God saw darkness. And he didn't bother to fight with the darkness. He didn't cast out spirit of darkness as we probably would do today. He just commanded light to be. And light took care of darkness. So in reading all these things, I discovered that there are some things that are just mutually exclusive. They are antithetical to one another. They cannot both be present at the same time. So in Ephesians 5 just now, when he began to talk about love, he gives us the example of Christ, uh, gives us Christ as our example. In talking about love, he refers to the self-sacrifice of Jesus as the expression of love. In other words, the antithesis of love, if you like, will be self-centeredness or selfishness. Vice versa. So, where there is self-centeredness or selfishness in your body, in your in, in uh, working in your members as an individual personality, you, you know it if you if you just be honest with yourself. The opposite of that is to work in love. Now, what are the things written in Ephesians chapter five? in reference to this business of love and self-sacrifice. He talks about fornication, uncleanness, covetousness, filthiness, foolish talking, and inconvenient jesting. Now, do you notice these things in yourself? Do you notice these things in the larger, <coughs> in the larger church? Do you notice these things? Then he talks about light, and he says that, for we are children of light, therefore we ought to walk as children of light. Why? Because it is possible to walk as we used to walk when we were not Christians, in darkness. 
And then he goes on to list the, 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 the concomitants of darkness. He said, walk circumspect, not as fools. That is a feature of walking in darkness. You just go anyhow because you don't know where you're going. You don't know what you're doing. You can't see. There's no light. And Jesus made that clear. So those who walk in darkness don't know where they're going, so they're going to stop them. He says, so walk circumspect, not as fools. He says, redeem the time. Let's, let's put that in simple English, make the best use of the time. Make the best use of the time. He says, be wise. In other words, to be foolish is a feature of darkness. And then he says, do not walk in excess as the drunk. Do not walk in excess as the drunk. So in one place he says, let your moderation be known to all men. So the, uh, the, the opposite of excess would be moderation. Or if you like, self-control. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he starts to talk about carnality and babes, maturity, he says, I fed you with milk. He says, he says I, I would have loved to talk to you as unto spiritual. I would have loved to talk to you as unto mature. But I can't because you still behave as carnal, ordinary men. So I had to feed you with milk rather than meat. Because there's still infighting and envying and divisions. There's strife among you, there's envy, there's divisions among you. And he says, so long as this is true of you, are you not yet canal? So there's canality in the church. Otherwise, Paul would not have written about it. Not just in the general or larger body of the body of Christ, but even in our individual members, in ourselves. There are some areas that we have not yet attained unto the majority. There are some areas that we still work as ordinary men. Canal. Then there is the business of the spirit versus the flesh. Now, if you go over to Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, you see there. 17, 16 and 17. It says the spirit and the flesh war against each other. I don't need to read the rest. The spirit and the flesh war against each other, so you cannot do what you want to do. Now, I've given four examples of situations that are mutually exclusive. You can't be in the spirit and be in the flesh at the same time. You can't be carnal and yet mature. You can't walk in light and be in darkness. You are a liar. So says First John chapter 1. You can't say you are in the light and you hate your brother. You cannot walk in love and yet be selfish at the same time. So now here's the thing. So God says, tell my people to return to me. What does that mean today in the light of all these things, that we, all the scriptures that we have looked at? First Corinthians chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 5, Colossians chapter 3, James chapter 4. What? How, 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 how do we apply it to the business of telling my people to return to me? In God, what will be found will be love, light, spiritual, or if you like, maturity, or if you like, perfection, and then spirit. The problem is, the word of God is addressing selfishness, darkness, Carnality and baby behavior and flesh in the church, among our members, individually and as a corporate body called the body of Christ. The word of God is addressing this situation. So when God says return to me, he is saying return to a dimension of love. Return to walking by light or walking in light. He's saying return to pursuing after maturity after the spiritual, after perfection. He says, for, for, though I have not yet 
I have not yet attained, I press on towards the mark of the high calling of Christ, from, from which I have been apprehended to Christ. He says, I press on, though I have not yet attained, I press on. I'm still pursuing maturity. I'm still pursuing, I, I, I'm still learning. I'm still going after the things that are yet lacking in me. The apostle is saying. So I said we should be prayer proactive. We should begin to be proactive. We should begin to, to take action. So what exactly can we do in the business of return to God? How do we enthrone God in our circumstances, individually, privately, in our members, and then in the larger body, the body of Christ? How do we enthrone God in the business of returning to Him? Because he says we should do the returning. In other words, it's up to us. Now, in my studies, I've discovered, if you like, three possibilities. If you find out others, good for you. In one of the scriptures that we read, he said, mortify your members. You have to do that. You have to put to death the desires of the flesh. You have to put down the flesh. That's your job. You can ask for help from the Holy Spirit, but it's not going to do it for you. You are going to have to deal with it yourself. He says, put a knife to your throat. If you know that you have a large appetite, the Holy Spirit is not going to put a knife to your throat. No, He already did that in the case of Jesus. You are the one who's going to do it. You have to deal with it. Yes, you can ask for help, the, the help will be supplied, but the issue is you are the one who will have to squeeze the trigger, assuming it's already gone. So it says, mortify your members. Then the Bible says that we should reprove these things which war or walk against our members. We should reprove them. You know, there's something Jesus said in, in, in John chapter 3. He says, he says, these people don't want to come to the light. They prefer to stay in darkness. Why? Because they know that if they come to the light, their works will be made manifest. Or rather, their works will be reproved. Or rather, their works will be revealed for what they are. They know that they are evil. So they stay away from the light because light will reveal what they are. So that's why they don't come. But the word reproof does not just mean those or only those things. At one time, reproof can mean to scold to take a stand against it. can mean to expose it, to make it manifest. It can mean to confute it. I didn't say confuse, I said confute. But you have to do something about it. No, no, let, me give, let me give an example of what I'm saying in the business of reform. Some time ago, not too long ago, not too long ago, perhaps within the last two years, I think, or something like that. I woke up one morning to go spend time with the Lord. And as I sat down in my usual place, my whole being was suffused with thoughts, with evil thoughts. I'm not going to name it exactly with time. My whole being was so this is about 2 a.m. Suddenly I realized this is not me. I have no reason to think these thoughts. This is not me. I'm not interested in these things, so why are these thoughts in my head? And so I realized that the thoughts were coming from somewhere else, or someone else, if you like. So I took the stand of the position of the Word of God, and I spoke the position of the Word of God out loud. You won't believe what happened within seconds after I spoke those words. It's like when Jesus was tempted, and he said, Get thee behind me, Satan. The moment I said those words, my mind cleared up. Those thoughts disappeared. And I realized, oh, so this thing is actually spiritual. It's a spiritual entity. Jesus said, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. 
So if Jesus talks to you about anger, it means that anger is spirit and life. If Jesus talks to you about love, it means love is spirit and life. So all these things that we have read about from all the scriptures that we have seen today, they are all spirit, spiritual entities. Like demons or angels, if you like. One side working for God, the other side working against. And they are warring in our members, trying to gain a foothold or trying to take control of the Christian. And God says, tell my people to return to me. So, under this circumstance, how do we return? I give an example now. In reproving the works of darkness, you declare it for what it is. If there are thoughts of, let's say, fornication or adultery, you reprove it, you declare for what it is. Devil, it is written, thou shalt not convert thy neighbor's goods, wife or whatever. Get thee behind me, Satan, for you, you do not, you do not pursue the things that be of God. Now you are using scripture, the word of God, to clear up the air. Now that's just an example. I said you can mortify our members, put down the desires of your flesh. You can do that. You can say an anointed no. But the third dimension of response is, for example, to cast out the spirit. So sometimes Jesus is confronted, well, when he was confronted with the boy who had uh, seizures. What did Jesus do? Send for a doctor? No! Somehow in himself, I guess by the function of the Holy Spirit, he realized that a deaf and dumb spirit was in oppression. So what did he do? He just cast out the spirit. And the boy was fine. Sometimes that's all we need to do for the dimension of God to be manifest in us. Just cast the spirit out. Or just reprove it. Expose it with the light of God. Sometimes it's just for you to say no. That's not of God. I will think those thoughts. And then you replace it with the thoughts of the word of God, for example. So so in more specific terms, I gave the example at the beginning. God saw darkness. He didn't cast out the spirit of darkness. He just did what? Let there be light. So sometimes, when you see the works of darkness as enumerated in the Bible, you don't need to be fighting with darkness. You don't need to fight darkness with darkness. You just say things like, let light be. So in returning to God, like he said, tell my people to return to me. You make a declaration of over yourself, like I did today. In everything that pertains to me, everything that concerns me, light be the light of God that is. In everything that pertains to me, my family, my work, my business, my ministry, my, my, my relationships, everything that pertains to me, love be. In everything that pertains to me, maturity, I call you forth. Let the spiritual prevail. That's the word I'm looking for. Perfection, yes. Let perfection be. In everything that pertains to me, let the spirit of Christ reign. Now what you do when you say those things, you automatically establish those things concerning you. Now they automatically gain the ascendancy because you have spoken them into being. And the rest is history. Light will push away darkness. Love will deal with selfishness. Maturity will set down carnality. And the spirit will deal with the flesh. For if you by the spirit mortify the desires of your flesh, you will live. Now this we can do. And every time you make such declarations concerning yourself, you return to the position of God just by saying the words. Just by saying the words, you return to the known position that is of God, light, love, maturity, or if you like, perfection, and then the spirit. Every time you say the words, those words take effect in your life. Instantly. Not that they will, 
Once you say the words, they take effect. And in doing this, you are returning to the place of God in your life. Do you understand what, you, what, I, what I'm saying now? When God saw darkness in the earth, he just said, light, read. And darkness disappeared. When you see any manifestation of darkness warring in your member, or you see it in the larger congregation of the church, there's no need quarreling with anybody. You just begin to speak the word of God. Father, I command light to shine in the body of Christ. I command light to shine in every one of the members of the body of Christ. You leave the word of God to be the word of God. Now, I'll close with this because really my time is up. A brother recently told me of an experience of this. He said that he noticed that over some time, he had noticed that it was becoming increasingly difficult for him to do anything for his wife. He wouldn't buy her anything. He wouldn't, whatever. There was strife in his home. He said that one day, the Lord showed him that a wrong spirit had entered his home. That he should declare love over his marriage. He said from that day, the love of God took over his marriage. And suddenly things that he would not do for his wife previously, found himself doing. He found himself doing. Now that's the kind of thing we believe about. In returning to God, we are returning to the dimensions of God as exposed in the Bible, as espoused in the Bible. Love, life, maturity, or if you like the spiritual, or if you like perfection. The spirit. He says, tell my people to return to me. In today's case, we're saying, tell my people to return to the various dimensions of existence that are found in me. Love, light, perfection, the spirit. How do you do that? It's, your mouth. it's not just enough to say, Father, I return to you. Yes, that's very good. But you can even take it further by declaring the love into your circumstances. Let love begin to reign in my sacrifice. Let the light of God that is in the face of Jesus Christ begin to reign in my sacrifice. Let perfection begin to manifest in my sacrifice. Let the spirit that is of Christ Jesus begin to show forth in my sacrifice. And when you begin to talk like that, you begin to see what you are saying. Rather than those things that we read of in the apostle wrote concerning the church when they say that the war is no members. The war. What's a war? So it's a confusion. There's an antithetical. There's a war going on. There's a fight going on. There's a just thing going on. You cannot Paul said, so I cannot do what I would have loved to do. He said he finds that there is a war going on in his members. So he cannot do what he wants to do. I've taken a bit more time today because I wanted to put the point out. Let's begin to be proactive. In returning to God, let's begin to speak the word of God in different dimensions over our lives and circumstances in the name of Jesus. And we must conclude this today right here, right now. But we'll be back again tomorrow. Same time. Until then, God bless you.